Today we're with Randall Lyons of the Massachusetts Marine Trades Association. And Randall, hot button topic, NOAA speed restrictions. Where's that going and how, how is it going to affect the industry? Yeah, absolutely, John. Uh, I appreciate uh, being here once again, and uh, thank you for the the time and the um, allocation to be able to discuss this issue. It is, and it's certainly something that we're trying to um, ultimately work more with NOAA on from a regulation standpoint. So, just a quick overview of the regulation: friction would be ten knots, which is eleven miles per hour for those boats. Put this um, regulation together. It, Ultimately, it is it is flawed. So we've we've tried to to do some outreach, and we've been working with our member organizations and national organizations to to again try to work more with NOAA, not against them, because we certainly do understand and value um, the right whale. Yeah. So when when I first heard of this regulation, and frankly, right up until now, you would just think ocean liners it would impact the shipping industry and the like, but. 35 foot, that's any commercial fishing boat, obviously, for that matter, and many pleasure craft. It, it is. And, and for our association, we ultimately represent the recreational boating industry. Um, and the number one um, activity done off of a boat is fishing. So you look at the effects of the commercial fishing, fishing boats, fishing tournaments, businesses up and down the coast. Um, it's a substantial amount of boats. And, and that was actually one of the statistics that um, Noah put out there that we felt was flawed. They, they, they mentioned the, the impact that they thought this would have would be on 9,000 boats. If you look at the Coast Guard data, it's actually 63,000 registered yeah. boats. So right there alone, it's like, hey, look, we've got to look at this a little bit from a larger standpoint, the larger lens to, to really understand and appreciate the negative impact this could have on businesses. And not only businesses, it's also, also a safety issue. Um, and happy to kind of go into that a little bit further. Well, how, how could they consider 9,000 boats? At, so they're saying there are no more than 9,035 foot boats out there? So the third, the way they looked at the, I, I, again, I don't really know where they came up with that data, but the, from that area, again, from Massachusetts down to the Florida coastline, 35 to, to 64, the, the information that they pulled was, was at that 9,000. We went back to the Coast Guard just to confirm the registered yeah. boats. It, it's in that 63,000 range. And, and I mentioned the safety concerns. So you look at a boat and, and just use that 35 to 40 foot range. They go offshore, they go offshore fishing. Once they get out into the, once they get out beyond the no wake zone, those boats aren't aren't designed to go ten knots. They're right. designed to go at a higher speed. And the, the issue being, if they're restricted at, at ten knots in in offshore conditions where it's three to six feet, it creates a safety issue for the boat, for the family. Um, if if the boat's not planing, it could it could very easily capsize. It could it could create very unsafe conditions, which, which would put families in danger. And yeah. again, it's just not they're just not designed to go that speed. And and there are better ways to enforce this regulation for sure. Yeah, Randall. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. <laughs> and and what's going on at Noah? I mean, this sounds like typical governmental overreach here in in an area that. Noah should be very familiar um, dealing with uh, coastal management and dealing with, uh, you know, the fisheries and everything else. They know that these boats need to, to steam out to even even for a smaller commercial operator to steam out to um, to tuna areas and the like. He's, he's got to do better than that. This this makes absolutely no sense. So I know you spent some time in Washington, D.C. as of late. How is that going for you? It was great. Um, we So on an annual basis, um, we go out for a conference called the American Boating Congress, which is sponsored by the, or hosted by, excuse me, the National Marine Manufacturers Association, um, NMMA. And NMMA is the, the host and the, and the provider of the New England Boat Show. So we have a, a strong partnership with them. But at the end of the day, the goal of the American Boating Congress is to, um, to kind of 
come together on the Hill, come together in DC um, on behalf of the of the boating industry. There's typically about 300 industry leaders from around the country. Um, in Massachusetts, I think we had about 10 um, total representatives from the state that went out there to DC. And um, you, you kind of have, have strong meetings with some of the uh, senators and representatives and their office staff. Um, they're speaking on behalf of, of their offices. They're coming to the, um, co the conference meetings to discuss some of the issues that we're faced with. Um, so the right whales was certainly a big topic for us. Um, E15 ethanol is, a, is another big topic that kind of always seems to, to float around, especially this time of the year. Oh, it Workforce sure does. Development. How, how's, how, how's that battle going? How, how, you know, it does. It, it's a tough one. I mean, we'll, we kind of admit it's, it's one that we feel like if ethanol is there, if E15 is out there, what our goal is to, is to come up with better um, signage. So these boats, it's 95% of boats are 26 feet and under. They're trailerable boats. So they're going to the gas stations to fuel up. And if they don't know E15, um, 85 is bad for their engines, that could create some major issues. So ultimately our goal was to try to promote and act and, and kind of actively pursue better signage for fuel box gas stations, especially to let, to make sure that boaters are aware this could create unsafe conditions for your engine and, and could be very costly down the, down the road as well. Yeah, it sure could. And what else was on yeah. the agenda with this visit? Um, workforce is a, is a continued topic for us. Um, it improved infrastructure on the waterways and some of the projects that are out there. Um, just kind of boater access, um, dredging, kind of ramps, marinas, mm -hmm. development, and anything mm -hmm. that kind of to promote the access on the waterway to make sure that people are aware of the economic impact that our industry has, um, that boaters are spending money. They're fueling the economy. They sure you get are. boaters Absolutely. to travel travel around. They're going to restaurants, hotels, yeah. shopping, you, you name it. So we're trying to just make sure that people are aware of that and the officials are aware of that as well. Well, and I think oftentimes those in DC see boating as a rich man's sport. You know, well, you know, the guy's got a boat like that. He can just afford to pay the fee. And we know it's that's yeah. not the case. That's not the case at all. That, yeah, that's not the case at all is right. And 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 I will say it, especially in Massachusetts, it, it's that's kind of the first thing that we point out is that, again, that statistic I mentioned, the 95 percent of boats are 26 and under. I think it's close to 65 percent of boat owners have a household income under 100,000. Mm -hmm. so there's another uh, another right. statistic that that kind of is very compelling. It is it, it, it is within reach, and and there's a there's a section at the New England boat boat show that's kind of boating affordability, and it talks about kind of the stepping stones to getting into the industry, starting off with a small boat, and that it is achievable. It's a it's a fantastic um, hobby, family friendly. It gets people out on the water. It gets them away from tech. It's, it's kind of, that's what we're, we're certainly promoting. It's the lifestyle of boating and, and the positive impacts that it brings. Yeah. And as you'll quickly find out at a, at a boat show that if you want to get into boating, they'll find a way to get you into boating. That's for sure. I mean, and they will, especially, boat, uh, we'll especially February in, in Massachusetts when they're, exactly. when they're, everybody's anxious to start yeah. talking about boating for sure. Right. So, so, so back to the speed restrictions. Um, how do you feel about it? Where do you think it stands now? What's the end game? So, so I think, from a collaborative standpoint within our industry and with within some of the sport fishing groups and national organizations that we're working with, again, we're taking the approach that we're trying to collaborate. We want to bring everybody to the table. Um, we want to provide more funding for NOAA and. and push forward some of the, the legislature that's out there to provide um, the ability to come up with better solutions, to, to, to come up with technological advancements, to, to, to attack this in a better manner. Um, we've got a, just in our region, I mean, we're, we're in one of the hubs for technological advancements and for kind of studying whales and, and the Stellwagen Bank area. So it's, it's bringing those people to the table and, and coming up with ideas to, to work together and not a, against each other, because we are absolutely not on that front. The, the boaters are, are kind of the original conservationists, and we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And 
our boaters want to go out there and see whales. They don't want to hit them. Nobody wants to hit a whale. Right. So it, right. it's kind of, it, <laughs> there, there's got to be a better way than just shutting down the, the, the kind of the waters to, to boaters. And, and that is what we feel will be the impact. I mean, you, you, you look at an offshore charter boat who's going offshore to, to fish with a family of a six pack license or whatever it may be a normal trip that would take them maybe an hour and a half, two hours. It's now going to take them four or five hours just to get out there. Who's projected to enforce this? Would it be Coast that's, Guard? I mean, that's the flip no. side. You, you talk to the Coast Guard right now, they, yeah. they already struggle yeah. to enforce regulations with the with the 65 plus boat. So that, yeah. that is absolutely going to be a, a, an extreme, a, a potentially, it's just not feasible to be, a, to be, to be frank. And I, and I do believe the Coast Guard would say the same thing. They may not publicly say it, but I, I think that they feel that there's no way this is going to be enforceable. Um, well, unfortunately, they, 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 would, they, they would probably go in the direction of the bigger commercial boats of pulling GPS data and onboard data and post finding that way. You know, they wouldn't have to, they're not going to be out there with speed traps, so to speak, yeah. but they could certainly yeah. find out from, from logs as to how fast the boats go, were going. Yeah. And that would be just terrible. That would be awful. Agreed. And that, that kind of goes back to the security, privacy and, and potential issues with trying to have some of those tracking systems on on recreational boats, because if, if they shut them off, that creates another safety issue. And just uh, I, I don't know, those are those are kind of some of the other struggles that are out there. And, and, and yeah, you just go back now. to the Frankly, data that that happens. That happens now on some commercial fishing boats. They'll they'll, they'll shut it yeah. off just because they might be skirting the limits somewhat. And that does create a safety issue. So yeah. if somebody wants to get involved and, and work to, uh, to get on the team to try to correct this or fight it or, or adapt it or do whatever it takes, what can they do? Yeah. Uh, they can certainly reach out to me from a, from a starting standpoint, especially on, a, on the state's, state level. Um, I'd be happy to, to point them in the right direction and point to them to some of the advocacy and the, the websites that have been set up. There's now a, there's now a, a focused working group coming, trying to come up with solutions to, to collaborate more. Um, and one of the latest things that I heard within that working group is trying to make sure that NOAA is involved. Um, so again, I can't echo that enough. We're not trying to do the wrong thing. We're trying to do the smart thing. Um, and there are definitely ways to improve this current regulation and come up with better solutions to this, to this problem. Who comes up with this? Like, like <laughs> who, you know, right. You, you've got to really wonder, all right, save the whale. I get it. We're all, we're all about that. We want to do the right thing. And the, the boats that they're trying to regulate are not the problem. I mean, their, their statistics are overwhelming that there's ex very, very limited number of vessel strikes and, and vessel deaths. And I get to it within a 15 year time frame for tracking this. I think there's been five um, vessel strikes that are for boats under 65 resulting in death. And only one of those vessel strikes resulting in a death was within this new area that they're trying to restrict. And that's a 15 year time frame over 5 million boat trips within this same category as well. So let's get specific about the area a little bit. Where, where is that area? Where is that corridor? It, it, so it does range. And I, and I will say there certainly are some certain time frames that it's going to be regulated as well up and down the coast. There's a specific map that I, I certainly could point you to, but it, it, it ranges, but it's Massachusetts coast down to the Florida coastline. Um, and then on the shore, it will show you little, little areas that it bumps out. And some areas, as I mentioned, it goes out 90 miles um, offshore. Hmm. So you've got, uh, is there a core group of marine trades associations along the Eastern Seaboard that are on that are on board with this and helping out? There are. I mean, I, I, it, a lot of it, it, we do rely on the national groups for sure, and MMA spearheading it, the Association of Sport Fishing, um, mm -hmm. some of the other national groups that are, are working with the states that are affected and the boaters and the manufacturers. But it's not just the association. It's not just these boaters. It's the, it's the, it's the larger scale. It's the manufacturers. And then it's what next if they if this comes up and and they they're able to pass something without without um, feedback. I mean that was the other side of it. They didn't reach out to stakeholders in advance of this. They just came up with the regulation and and <laughs> worried about what's next. But it, it certainly would have been nice if there was more contact with stakeholders um, from the get go. Well, and I'm I'm certain that there are many carriers from other countries that won't abide. Mm -hmm. 
by yeah. this uh, speed limit and they'll eclipse mm -hmm. us and whatever they're, they're doing in competition with us. And how do yeah. you do that? What do you send them a ticket? and hope they pay the yeah. fee, you know? Yeah. yeah, and somebody pointed out to me the other recently about offshore wind, and you, and you think about the offshore wind that's coming, especially in, the, in our state, and, and I know there's it's going to be years from now, but you better believe those boats going back and forth to service those those turbines are, it's going to be hard press for them to go 10 knots when they're well, trying to get out have, there. And, you might have <laughs> just hit, you might have just hit on something. It could be a twist for us. OK, you need to alert the offshore wind industry and say, look, you're not going to get your turbines built. If this thing goes through, although they'll probably yeah. get some kind of a of an exception, I would I, guess. I'm sure. Yeah. We're, we're, we're trying to get everybody to the table. We're trying to to work collabor co collaboratively together to come up with better solutions to fix to, to, to work together to try to come up with the answers to to how we can resolve this without just coming up with a blanket regulation that's not realistic so that's kind of our our ultimate goal is to collaborate not not work against each other you know randall uh this is the first podcast or interview that i've had with you you've been so serious so i know this is a serious issue on the lighter side tell me about the great things going on at the massachusetts marine trades association Absolutely. I mean, it's it's go time. It's we're we're right upon the season. So I know last time we chatted was at the the boat show, and yeah, it was kind of time. a it was a long way away from the boating season. But now we're here. We just passed uh, Memorial Day weekend. We've got uh, some big events coming up this this week. It's uh, National uh, Boating and Fishing Week, and here in this state, we kind of do our own thing. It's called Mass Kids mm -hmm. Boating and Fishing Week, and we're promoting um, different events that are going on around the state to try to get more kids on the water boating and fishing. Um, so right now there's seven registered um, events starting on Saturday, June 3rd. And um, that's kind of the key to our industry. We want to get uh, people started early to get them out on, on the water, to get them out fishing and doing the recreational activities. Sure. Um, Cause it does, it does start at a young age and, and the earlier you can start them, the better you're going to get them uh, hooked and hopefully become future boaters or, or maybe even working in the industry, which is another another critical aspect of what we're, we're doing with the association as well. Um, we've continued to work with the state and we have a, a, a very, very supportive boating caucus. And um, we're, we're right now in the process of the current budget to try to get more funding to focus on, on supporting the schools that we partner with, supporting our member businesses. Um, there's continues to be new programs that are starting up. I meant, I don't know, actually I didn't mention, but Salem High School is, is a program that's up and coming. Um, programs in existence right now there are the day programs Whittier Tech on on the North Shore just started their day program this this um, this school year I think they had 15 students so they were reg they were full um, and that's that's what it's all about it creates a new pipeline of, of potential future employees that will be entering the industry that are getting appropriately trained on a consistent basis so so we work closely with about 10 schools um, in the area. Two community colleges now are very involved, Bunker Hill Community College, Cape Cod Community College. So we're, we're, we're looking for more training avenues and we're, we're certainly making sure to get the word out there to our member businesses and getting more people involved. And of course you give tools to those who are new in the industry, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, one of our programs is, is a tools of the trade funding. So what we'll do is for, um, our member businesses, we offer out there a program um, to support a new employee that has entered the industry that typically they're buying their own um, tools and we'll, we'll give them a little stipend, um, typically a $300 gift card to, to help kickstart that, that toolbox. And again, to encourage them to, to make sure that they're aware, hey, welcome to the industry. We're glad you're here and we want you to stay. And, and that's what it's all about. It's a, it's an awesome industry and it's just getting people more involved and, and letting them know of the opportunities that are there. And of course is stay local boat MA, which is an awesome program. It always has been. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, it's actually, I think it's in its 15th year now. And, and the goal of stay local boat MA is to encourage boaters to travel around, around the coast of Massachusetts. So I think there's approximately 4,000 boaters that are involved. There's 17 marinas that participate this year. And, and the goal is to encourage boaters to travel in groups. And by doing so, they receive a, a larger discount on dockage. So the discounts range, even if they travel by themselves, they still get a discount, but the dockage discounts range from 10 to 20%. 
Um, there's 17 marinas on the coast, everywhere from the North Shore to the Cape. Um, and we're encouraging them to get out, use their boats, travel to the different ports in the state, spend the money on fuel, shopping, restaurants, whatever it may be to help stimulate the economy here in Massachusetts and, and, and kind of vacation and keep, keep the money here. It's a, that's kind of the goal. Again, the boaters are spending money and we want them to travel. So tell me a little bit about it. So you say groups of boaters. So the intent there is to get Correct. boaters to travel together, which makes sense, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And when they roll into yeah. so, a marina, you might get four or five boats coming in at the same time. Is that is, is that the idea? Correct. And, and the nice thing is that if, if that does happen and you get those groups to travel, and, and I'll give you the quick breakdown, one to four boats, it's a 10% discount, five to nine boats, a 15% discount, and 10 plus boats, it's a 20% discount. So if you come, it kind of some of the, the, the wording might be a rendezvous. If you can get a rendezvous of boats together, travel to one marina, at the end of the day, that creates 10 open slips at that marina. And in the ideal scenario, the marinas work together and they send boats back and forth. And, and if that can happen, that's that's awesome. Because that's that's kind of what the goal is to open slips to to transient guest dockage and and promote your seasonal boaters and give them a, a little a little incentive to to get out there on the waterways as well. So how can how can marinas participate in that program? Yeah, do you have to be so the, the, the website MPA? It is. So it's a membership offering for MMTA, ultimately getting the word out there. We have had non-members participate in the past, but um, the main website for that is staylocalboatma.com. And, and they're welcome to take a look to, to learn a little bit more about the marinas that are participating um, on an annual basis. Awesome. Randall Lyons of the Massachusetts Marine Trades Association. Keep, the, keep, keep up the good work, man. We love what you're doing. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate it. Appreciate the uh, time and always, uh, always great to chat with you. The Drift Podcast can be found at driftsociably.com or where all fine podcasts are heard.